Hello and welcome to the Green Left News Podcast. My name is Isaac Nellist and I'm joined by Riley from Bully Perth. Hello. It's been a few weeks since our last episode of the podcast and uh, we're actually changing things up a little bit. So if you've been listening for uh, the past year and a bit of we've been doing the podcast, we've been going through all the news of the week, both Australian and international news uh, that's relevant for activists engaging in you know, struggles for a better world. Um, we've decided to uh, do a d- little d- bit of a different style. We're going to spend a bit more time focusing on some of the key stories of the week. And um, so we have a bit more space. So we won't be going through every single story, which you can still find at uh, greenleft.org.au. But we'll be going through with a bit more detail uh, some of the big stories. So we're very excited to uh, try out this uh, new format and uh, look, looking forward to hearing... Uh, some feedback and stuff from listeners as well. So uh, before we kick off, I'll just mention that we are recording on stolen land that was never ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I'm personally speaking from Gadigal country uh, in Sydney. Um, and I'm speaking from uh, Wadjuk Noongar country here in uh, Bulu, Perth. Yes, and um, uh, Green Left is committed to supporting the struggles for First Nations justice, both here on this continent, but also all around the world. big story that we're going to talk about this week is the student encampment movement. We've been covering this, uh, the news around this on the podcast for the past few months, or past month and a half, I think it's been since the encampments were initially set up in the US um, and it spread internationally. I think there's over 140 encampments all around the world. So yeah, there's been so uh, such a huge movement, and in, in Australia here we've had at least 13 universities with uh, student encampments set up um, in solidarity with the uh, people of Palestine who are undergoing the Israel's uh, brutal genocidal assault uh, for uh, about eight months now. And the enc- encampments were kind of set up uh, to highlight that the universities are complicit in the genocide through... Uh, various deals and agreements with weapons companies and uh, Israeli uh, institutions. And the kind of big call of a a majority of the encampments was to disclose these agreements and then divest from Israel. So just to say where we're currently at, um, we're heading kind of into the uni break period. So a lot of the encampments, for various reasons, have closed down. But there's also been some significant wins and uh, that are worth uh, talking about and and then also think about you know where's the movement going to go going forward um so i guess to start off with the the encampment that's closest to me which is at the university of sydney or ucid where the encampment is going to continue over the winter break um which is you know pretty exciting that and um it's great to see that you know the momentum isn't isn't dying off despite you know the the semester break going yeah one of the reasons for this is because uh the university administration has pretty much refused to even consider disclosing or divesting so um that's a different position to some of the other universities where there's been some wins um i know you're obviously in in perth and the big encampment in perth is uh curtain which um we've heard has won uh, some uh, way towards a disclosure agreement. Did you want to kind of talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I can talk a bit about it. I've attended a camp quite a number of times. Um, the main thing that's happened with that camp has been, I, I believe it was last week, um, uh, towards the end of the semester, there was this, uh, the students of Palestine on Curtin Camp decided to occupy a building in a, in a similar manner to uh, as, as has happened in campuses uh, across the rest of the country, as well as in other countries. Um, at the same time that happened, the Guild reached a memorandum of understanding with uh, the, um, the university 
management that uh, I believe, um, and this is just off memory here, um, agreed that the university would di uh, disclose its investment partnerships, but not its research partnerships. Mm. And so uh, we've got we've got a bit of a funny situation on uh, on Cur Curtin where they they continue to claim that they have no investment in uh, in, in Israeli companies, but of course that's that's um that's true on the surface but the real money the 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 place where the, the money actually changes hands is in its research partnerships which they still haven't actually disclosed the the amounts of we know that they exist um so as far as i'm aware the university is still somewhat claiming that it it has you know it's got clean hands here and we all know that's not true um yeah, so that's... it'll be interesting to see where this movement goes forward from there the cap at the end of the semester basically decided, you know, there was no point waiting out through the cold and the rain. It was already, you know, it, it had a really strong momentum, but, um, you know, it's during the semester break when people are camping over the cold and rain, like you're not going to build momentum during that period. So it's it's better to conserve your, your energy and your juice and then come back with a bang in the next semester. And I think that's um, that's the conclusion the camp generally reached. Yeah, well, I think that's been a common thing across a lot of the encampments um, and also as well as happened in the US and in other countries is the university administration kind of saying, yeah, yeah, we're, we're listening, we're hearing you, we'll, 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 know, we'll look into disclosure um, but or we'll, take, we'll start discussing things in kind of backroom negotiations and they're kind of all these kind of cynical attempts to demobilize the students. But... Um, there has been some good wins coming out of those things. I mean, as you mentioned with Curtin, one of the other limitations is there's these kind of national security reasoning that they can give for not sharing some, um, disclosing all of their deals and as well. So there's that, there's that element. Um, I like, you mentioned the, uh, uh, occupation of, of the building at Curtin Uni and, and that was one of the inspiring things that happened at the University of Melbourne, which was where um, students took over what was the Arts West building uh, and renamed it Mahmoud's Hall, which is in honor of a 25-year-old uh, from Gaza who was uh, killed by an Israeli airstrike uh, in October. And Mahmoud had actually been awarded a scholarship and was intending to go to the University of Melbourne and study uh, a master of international relations so that was a really kind of a uh, inspiring part of that um campaign at, at the university of melbourne and that's one of the campuses where they have won uh, a disclosure agreement as well so um it shows the kind of the pressure that put on on the campus administration another really good one that um well the other thing is that they, they still have obviously want to push to divest but that's kind of going to be where the next stage potentially next semester um the other really exciting one was at the university of queensland where there was a historic um student uh, general meeting where there was over a thousand students that tried to uh, attend this meeting to support uh pretty much a motion to for the university to divest from uh, israeli companies and arms companies and i think it's one of only very few uh, student general meetings that have happened at the university um, and one of the only ones that wasn't initiated by the student union so um, uh, there's a lot of great photos and videos from that up on green left social media um, and there's a great report from one of the uh, activists who's been involved in the students of palestine group at uh, uq as well so definitely worth checking out um uh there's I guess it's not all good news stories. One of the big things that this encampments have had to deal with is, you know, these either threats or actual attacks from Zionists, like uh, right-wing thugs coming in in the night and kicking up tents, destroying equipment, uh, or it could be university management um, threatening students with, you know, academic punishment or yeah i believe a um australian national university student was actually suspended this student was on the abc saying that the the palestinian resistance should be supported um 
the university took the step to expel them um, and there's been some protests around that. I mean, at ANU in particular, uh, they tried to shut down the encampment, um, which was then the students decided to continue but to relocate to another area, which was still uh, like a kind of major part of the campus. Um, and another element at ANU was the uh, construction, forestry, mining and energy union stopping construction work at the campus in solidarity with the students, which was a, a great win. Um, and I saw um, footage or, or, or images of the CMU being quite cheeky because the, um, or not, sorry, I'm going to repeat that so I don't defame the CFMU. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, I saw some great uh, images of, so the, I believe the, the ANU encampment was being cleared out on the the pretense that it posed a safety risk uh, due to fire hazards, which is just, you know, totally convoluted and made up. Um, and I think this is, this is quite a while ago, but the CFMU actually came in and did their own safety inspection saying, giving it the all clear. So that was, you know, a really fantastic show of solidarity as well as the, um, the later stop work, which was, um, they were quite clear to say was uh, related to safety issues on the campus. Um, yeah, so it's been good to see that like extra element of um, union solidarity. I mean, uh, it's like a, there's obviously a lot more that could be done, but um, another good example of kind of where workers have been able to support the encampments and also, I guess, vice versa, where uh, the action by students has given, um, you know, the workers a boost at, on the campuses is the NTU, the National Tertiary Education Union at uh, the uh, Sydney Uni, passed a, a boycott motion um, for the university to uh, pretty much divest and boycott Israeli institutions. And that was uh, a really historic kind of vote within the, the branch. I think it was 97% voted in favor of that. Um, wow, so it's pretty, that's a pretty lot. awesome. Um, so it shows there's like this, there's, there's a lot of support for the Palestine movement. And I think the student encampment movement, which, you know, is, is in a bit of a, of a kind of a subdued moment because of the breaks and exams and we'll see what happens next semester, but it's kind of good to look back at, you know, all the things that have happened and all the victories. I mean, we'll probably, uh, wrap up on talking about it for this episode, but definitely, check out all the coverage at greenleft.org.au. We've been covering a lot of the encampments um, and all the different victories and wins. And also just a quick plug for uh, an interview we did with the some student activists in the US um, who were involved in the encampments over there. Um, some of them are from the Young Democratic Socialists of America and others are just from the, their, their university uh, Palestine group. Um, but it's really interesting to hear their perspectives on what's happening. And we've just got a, a follow-up interview that will be online shortly. Um, oh, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, the, the I watched the first one there. The students that you interviewed were very sharp and um, politically tuned in. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, before, we do, before we move on, there is one thing that I, I'd like to bring up as well, which is just something that's come up here in Perth recently. So we were talking about... Um, uh, intimidation tactics against the student encampments. Mm. So um, on Monday, we had uh, President of the Australian Palestinian Advocacy Network, Nasser Masashi, giving a public talk at the at University of WA. Mm. Um, and so uh, this was an event organised by the um, Palestinian Society of WA in coordination with Friends of Palestine WA. At the last minute, they um, demanded that they no longer allow any further registrations for um, for people to attend, despite the fact that the, the lecture hall was nowhere near capacity. Um, in addition, at the door, they demanded that the, um, the people who were putting on the event keep uh, write down the name of every single person attending, whether or not they were a student, a staff member, or neither. Wow. And this is just clearly because UWA is fucking shitting itself that there's going to be a, a camp there mm. and they're trying to preempt this and possibly even impose, you know, preemptive sanctions or God knows what. Um, right. So this is the kind of intimidation tactics we're up against. Um, UWA has 
some close ties with some companies. I don't have the exact details uh, on me right now, but I believe there is some talk of potentially doing an action there next semester. So that'll be really exciting to see. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways that they're they're trying to shut down, um, you know, the Palestine Solidarity Movement. There's, you know, claims of anti-Semitism, particularly against the camps, uh, especially early on. There's people saying they, you know, hotbeds of anti anti-Semitism on campus, um, which is, you know, proven to obviously be untrue. With a lot of, um, you know, uh, anti-Zionist Jewish groups are directly involved in organizing and supporting their camps um absolutely i was just gonna i just want to just one other thing on the the curtain camp this is a funny story um a couple of weeks ago there was news of a, a zionist rally that was going to happen at the at the curtain camp mm. um and so you know people were quite concerned about what that would entail whether or not there would be a confrontation um you know people turned up as marshals to try and make sure that there was a counter demonstration that wasn't a violent conflict, you know, just a peaceful speak out. Uh, and it was, it was a great rally. <laughs> and, and simultaneously there was this Zionist rally that didn't even come near us. Um, and I saw, we, we had someone there taking footage of them, right? And I, I think you can actually find this on the students for Palestine uh, Instagram, students for Palestine WA Instagram. They are, there was not a single person in that audience that was uh, either under the age of 40 <laughs> or uh, anything other than white. So it was just, it was, it was so plain what the demographic of these groups actually is mm. and what their interest actually is. It wasn't about feeling threatened. I mean, they're not students. I mean, yeah. I'm sure maybe some of them are mature age students. I've been a mature age student, but I very much doubt <laughs> that March was uh, student led. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we've had similar things here in in Gadigal, Sydney, but I think it's been good to see that, like, where there have been kind of Zionist counter protests to student encampments and stuff, like there has been a lot of support from the general community coming to support the students and the encampments and stand kind of against the um, the Zionist protests. So in Sydney, we had one probably about a month ago now, where you know about five hundred students and community members came out to support to defend the encampment from about you know 100 or 200 uh, zionist counter protesters so uh that's been another element that's been good um i just wanted to point people to you mentioned like uh listing some of the kind of companies that uh that the universities do have deals and um ties with there's a great graphic that was put together by honi swa which is the university of sydney um student paper and we've republished the graphic on green left but it pretty much is like a a little kind of short list of here's a bunch of the what well, each different university their ties with various companies so it's good to look oh, at I've not seen this. a general sense um yeah I'll, I'll send it to you after this but it's 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 very uh handy you see a lot of the common names like BA, bae systems boeing lockheed martin it's a who's who of war criminals <laughs> yeah exactly um but there's also a, a bunch of more, more kind of specific ones that uh, only at certain universities and things like that. So be, um, I think there's a note on it. It's not an exhaustive list. Like there's probably more that will come out with these if if disclosure demands are one. But um, I thought it's, it's a great graphic kind of showing that the, these ties and interconnected deals with all these different uh, universities. <laughs> So just to move on from from the student encampments, uh, another uh, story that happened recently was that um, nearly 2,000 public servants have signed an open letter calling on the federal government to stop military exports to Israel. So just so people know, if, if you're a public servant, you're not really supposed to uh, publicly talk about you know politics and your opinion on various issues. Uh, and you can actually, like, there's a risk of getting fired or getting uh, punished for uh, for doing so. So that shows the kind of the bravery of these uh, public servants who have spoken out. And there's more and more people signing signing on um, all the time. 
um, the kind of open letter called on uh, to the, was addressed to the Prime Minister and, and MPs, and it said, aside from the dishonour of assisting what the Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency has termed a war on children, Australia may now be violating international law and complicity in uh, criminal warfare. So uh, that's another exciting development and pr- huge props to all the uh, public servants who have signed on so far, um, especially when there's a s- kind of, you know, a personal risk attached as well. As soon as the letter went out, which was on May 30, you know, the next day, a bunch of public servants had already received, you know, this warning email from the department of the premier and cabinet, pretty much saying like discouraging people from signing on to the letter and, you know, warning people that there could be punishment. So they really don't want people speaking out. Um, there's, we'll put a link in the podcast description, but pretty much all local state or federal employees are encouraged to sign and take a stand against Australia's complicity in the, uh, Israel's genocide on Gaza. Um, I think one thing about this is it shows the depth that the uh, genocide is impacting people and I guess the impact, you know, of this kind of sustained eight months of protest um, all around the country. Like, I know in in Sydney and Melbourne there's been a rally every single weekend, plus, you know, a million other actions happening uh, throughout the week and that pressure is really starting to... uh, to get through to, to broader layers of people. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it bears, bears noting that, um, sorry, I'm just going to think of what I'm going to say and then I'll yeah. start again. Um, I've lost my train of thought. Um, oh yeah, it bears noting that, um, you know, uh, I think it was a YouGov poll that uh, said that 81% of Australians actually support a ceasefire in Palestine. And this was before the the murder of the aid worker whose name I, um, I unfortunately uh, don't Zoe remember. Um, and so, of course, you know, it's, it's as as the horror has only escalated, that, that number has surely only gone up and up. I think we, we see a lot of people at rallies that... Oh, sorry. Start that again. I think there are a lot of people that are you know, 100% on board that we actually don't see at rallies. I mean, here in Perth, you know, you think um, our rallies are usually, you know, unless there's some specific uh, spark, you know, some new atrocity that people are really mobilised by, it's usually about two or 300 people. And that's, that's in a city that's three and a half million people. Mm. So it's actually quite small, but, um, you know, that's just actually a tiny fraction of the people that want to do something. Um, and so I think stuff like this actually shows that there is a real broader layer of society that really does care. Uh, they don't necessarily come to rallies. A lot of them don't even know the rallies are on, at least here. Mm. Um, and, or if they do, they just, you know, they don't think that rallies achieve anything or they don't see the point or whatever, you know, there are numerous reasons why people don't show up that, you know, we, we could have a a discussion about, Mm. but, um, I think this really shows that there is such a broad uh, a layer of society that does care and is willing to actually put their neck on the line here because this is not trivial. You know, they are actually risking their jobs. But the the more people put their name on the list, hopefully, you know, it's a bit like um, a bit like union logic. You know, you can't fire us all, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, strength in numbers, and I hope that number just continues to go up. <laughs> move on to now to our third and final story of the week which is over in South Africa where they had general elections which took place on the 29th of May and for the first time since the end of apartheid in 1984 uh, 1994 sorry the African National Congress has not received um, the enough votes to form government on its own um, so the ANC uh, which took power at the end of apartheid uh, with Nelson Mandela uh, as its leader um, has pretty much won every election uh, since 1994. Uh, and this time round, 
it did still get the most votes and still was the the biggest party, but it didn't get enough to form government on its own and we'll have to seek coalition partners to stay in government. Um, as we're kind of recording, there's been news over the last kind of 12 hours about uh, some some of these coalition agreements. So it looks like it'll be uh, a national unity government between the ANC and the Democratic Alliance, which is one of the bigger uh, opposition parties, as well as the Inkatha Freedom Party. Um, but yeah, that's news to me, but disappointing. Yeah, so that, that's uh, still kind of up in the air, hasn't been confirmed. Uh, um, so we'll have to follow up on that. Um, but that's kind of where it's sitting at the moment. Um, we actually had a, an interview with South African socialist Mazi Bukojara uh, just before the elections, who, who told Green Left that the reason that the ANC's vote has kind of fallen is because they've you know failed to address the grievances of, of the people, like haven't kind of lived up to the expectations that were set. Um, and he said that this has given a real opportunity for the uh, the white liberal parties and also increasingly black and white conservative uh, forces to kind of gain some power in society. Um, so it's, a, it's definitely a step backwards, but it's um, something that could have been that uh, people who are, who've been following this have, are not surprised. Like it was going into the elections, people were kind of expecting the ANC not to do as well as they had previously. Definitely. I mean, you know, the ANC is, is far from perfect. It has its own real problems that I think mm. should have, have, um, have contributed to this. Uh, the, the part that I find disappointing is that, um, you know, for all of, for all of the, the very valid criticisms we can make of the countries involved in the BRICS alliance, um, that South Africa is a part of, in fact, I think it was quite a leading member of, or is quite a leading member of currently, um, for all of its problem, um, yeah, for all of its problems, it, it did still pose an a an alternative, albeit capitalist, block to the US uh, dominance. Um, and you know, while I, I don't want to see the rise of a country like Russia as a as a dominant economic block, um, that inter imperialist competition did actually uh, pose the does actually pose the potential of future you know people's movements within those countries without in us interference so it definitely is a step backwards i think if they do go through with this coalition because uh the democratic alliance is quite pro-west and that means that we we might potentially see a realignment of south africa towards uh so-called western liberal democracy and the us bloc mm. rather than uh kind of charting its own course with BRICS. how it was put by uh, Mazabuko Jara in the interview was that you know there has been a a neoliberal trajectory that the country's been on since like the end of apartheid um and he kind of said that this this election represents a step backwards for you know black working class people and that the neoliberal trajectory will deepen so um yeah it's not it's, a, it's definitely a bad news um I think people should definitely check out the the full article uh, interview with uh, with Mazabuko, which is on Green Left, and it's also uh, printed in full at uh, links.org.au. Um, the other thing would be to tune in to uh, Eco Socialism 2024, where South African human rights activist Salim Valley is one of the keynote speakers. So he's from South Africa's National Research Foundation and he's based at the University of Johannesburg. And Salim is, is one of a great list of incredible speakers who are gonna be speaking at the conference in Perth on the 28th to the 30th. Um, so just wanted to, to give that a plug. I'd, I'd say to people who, if you're in Perth, definitely try and come along, but the majority of people who are not in Perth, uh, all this- Which is the majority of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it might, maybe if you're if you've got the money to buy some last minute flights, you can come around. But for the majority of people, it's going to be easier to join online. Uh, the sessions will be available to 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 live stream and join online, um, and you can just pay uh, get a ticket at ecosocialism.org.au. 
um, to join. Uh, we're also yeah. asking for people who have the means to uh, purchase a solidarity ticket, which is a um, hundred dollar ticket uh, to attend the conference either in person or online. Now, obviously, not everyone can can has the means to afford that, but if you do, it will pretty much go towards um, bringing over this incredible list of speakers. So I wanted to kind of give a bit of a rundown of who some of the speakers are at the conference um, and what some of the kind of key sessions will be. So we've spoken a lot about on the podcast before uh, that the keynote speaker is uh, Leila Khaled, who's a iconic Palestinian revolutionary activist from the uh, Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, or PFLP, and is a representative on the Palestine National Council. Now, uh, as people might have heard, Leila Khaled is not been allowed to come to the country um, before she even pushed for a visa. Uh, before she could even apply, the Labor government said that they wouldn't allow her to come. And now there's even attempts to bl- block her from coming just via video link, so via Zoom or any other kind of software. Um, so uh, it's going to be incredible to hear from Leila Khaled, who's been involved in Palestinian fighting for Palestinian liberation for, for decades. That's right. Became kind of known around the world for being the first uh, uh, woman to hijack a plane. Go girl boss. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's going to be it's it's going to be really great to to hear from Leila. Some of the other speakers include um, Dana Lechumi Langsauran from the Malaysian Socialist Party, Amar Ali Jan, who's from Hakuke Kalk or People's Rights Party in Pakistan. Um, Clifton de Rosario from the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist Liberation, uh, Mariana Riscali, who's from the uh, Socialism and Liberty Party in Brazil, um, as well as uh, speakers from the Philippines, Singapore, Indonesia, Ireland, uh, the US, uh, and Kanaki, um, as well as, you know, a bunch of great local activists. Uh, Including both of us. Yes, yes. So if you want to come and come and hang out with us or come and uh, meet a bunch of awesome activists, come along or tune into the sessions online. I'll just say again, it's ecosocialism.org.au. The, if you want to hear Leila Khaled speak, she's on the opening panel on Friday night, which is 6.30 p.m. Um, from the River to the Sea, Palestine will be free, along with Salem Valley and Nasser Mashni from... Australian Palestine Advocacy Network. Yeah, and, and, and like I said, um, I, I saw him speak on Monday, and after having seen that, I am absolutely looking forward to seeing what he and Leila have to talk about together because they. I mean, th- this is a fucking stellar lineup. Hundred um, percent. Yeah, and he's been travelling around to a lot of the uh, different cities and towns who have been having, you know, protests and speaking. So he's got a been across the the movement here in Australia. And the final speaker on that panel is Khaled Ghanem, who's a Palestinian activist who, uh, based in Sydney, who um, has had a lot of great insights. And I mean, I've had the privilege of talking to him a lot about what's happening, you know, on the ground in in Gaza and also uh, in the solidarity movement here. So that opening panel is 6.30 p.m. in Perth. But if you're in the east, if you're in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane, uh, just take the time time difference into consideration so you add, add two hours so it'll be at 8 30 p.m over here if you're joining online the um the full agenda on the website will also list the time in both time zones to make that a little bit easier for those over east yeah 100 percent. but yeah there's other great sessions on first nations sovereignty uh lgbtiq liberation uh organizing workers in unorganized industries uh one that looks particularly interesting is uh, how capitalism ruined the internet. Um, and there's, you know, a, a bunch more. So check out the full agenda online and, and, and get, a sol- sol- get a solidarity ticket or uh, the other tickets are waged and unwaged. So it's, it's going to be a really awesome conference. We'll also hopefully get the chance to publish some of the talks and things on the Green Left website and on YouTube and, and podcast feed. So... Keep your eyes peeled for all that great stuff. Um, and uh, apart from the, the fantastic speakers, on the Saturday night as well, we're going to have uh, a performance by uh, noted uh, lefty folk, folk singer, David Rovix. 
Uh, and so we can look forward to that as well. That's a separate ticketed event, I believe. And I don't think it'll be streamed online. So that's just a special treat for those of you that uh, make the make the trip down to Perth. Yes, I'm very much looking forward to that as well. Um, just uh, another thing before we wrap up, make sure you get out to your, you know, local Palestine actions in some cities, like I mentioned, Sydney, Melbourne, they're every weekend on Sundays, other other cities are every fortnight and or um, monthly, but there's always always things happening. So you can check out the Green Left calendar, greenleft.org.au slash events to find out more about what's happening in your area. Um, and if you have enjoyed this podcast or want to find out more about what we do, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. It's only $5 a month to become a digital supporter and you get the, the uh, paper sent to your email uh, as a PDF or it's only $10 a month to get the physical you know, physical paper sent to your house, to, to your address, um, which I think is a pretty good deal. I know people are struggling with cost of living at the moment, but if you put it in context, it's like less than getting, you know, a beer every week or a coffee. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's not too bad. It's very good. And for a bonus, you can get the, the paper and go and do what I do. It's uh, re- You know, there's something very special about having a, a physical paper, I think. You know, people, people don't do that very much, but... Uh, actually going to a cafe, opening the the paper and reading it there is, is um, you know, I think that's actually got something special that's worth worth doing. And then you can also leave the paper there for people to find and maybe get involved themselves because they they haven't heard of us. A hundred percent. Or even the other exciting thing about getting the hard copy paper is you get a poster uh, every other issue pretty much. So that's, that's always good. Stick it up on your wall or take it to a rally. Um, that's an, another added bonus. So we'll we'll wrap up for this episode. I hope you hope people have enjoyed the, the new kind of format. Um, I certainly have. And it's great to have you here, Riley, doing a bit of a you know coast to coast across the country podcast. Um, yep, the two most important cities in the country: Sydney and Perth. <laughs> Melbourne, I've never heard of it. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye.